V. Anton Sprawl here with the Co-Optimus review of Shadowrun Chronicles, colon, Boston Lockdown. Right off the bat, I have to say that subtitles on games make me a little sad, because you know the game makers are hoping to launch a franchise that's probably never going to happen. I'm old enough to remember a little movie called Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, which could have just as accurately been called Remo Williams, The Adventure Ends. And then there's the strange fact that here in 2016, the ESPN website is still officially a part of Disney's Go.com portal. Disney, take your own advice and let it go. I'm reviewing this game primarily as a co-op title. The game can be played by up to four players eventually, which I'll explain in a minute. So what is Shadowrun Chronicles, colon, Boston Lockdown? If you've played games like XCOM or Jagged Alliance, Shadowrun is based on that kind of turn-based tactical action. The world of Shadowrun is like a mashup of Tolkien fantasy and cyberpunk, so you end up with dwarves and elves escaping a dystopian future by jacking into the Matrix. Other Shadowrun games have been more firmly in the RPG camp, but this game has just light RPG elements. Basically, you've got a talent tree and gear progression, and other than that, you're marching through a series of combat-heavy main missions with a few side missions. There's a story that ties it all together, but there's no open world or exploration or dialogue trees or anything like that. Now the first thing I judge any co-op game by is how easy it is to get me and my friends in the same game. The worst game I ever played in this respect was probably Warface, which is sad because the game was made to promote G-Face, a social gaming platform, so you would think it would have been a priority to make it easy to get everyone together. Anyway, SC, colon, BL, gets a middling grade on the ease of co-op. In theory, all you have to do is bring up your list of friends and invite them to your party. The problem is, sometimes people don't show up as online even though they are. One workaround I discovered is to have the supposedly missing friend say something in the global chat then you can right-click that name in the chat window and invite from there. But if that doesn't work, the supposedly missing person just has to leave the game and come back and keep doing that until they show up for the party leader. The main gameplay itself is quite fun. If you've ever played something like XCOM and thought, wow, it would be fun to play this with friends as my squad mates, you're likely to enjoy this. Each turn, you can execute one of two actions per character, and once you attack, your turn is done regardless. All the good guy actions happen first, then the bad guys move, and so on. But there's no set ordering of actions among you and your team. Anyone with an action left can act at any time, which creates some good possibilities for strategic teamwork. This is where having a voice comm like Mumble or TeamSpeak really comes in handy. Maybe you need one player to use a stun grenade to keep a couple of bad guys on ice for a turn, while everyone else beats on the boss, for example. Or some attacks will leave an enemy marked, and those marks can be exploited by other players' abilities. These synergies extend to the character customization, which occurs in between missions in this colorful back alley. Missions award karma points that are spent on abilities in various talent trees. The first two trees are sort of generic and aid damage and survivability, and also provide additional ways to loot during the missions. All the other trees are based upon certain gear, so the pistol skills are only useful when you're carrying a pistol, and rigging allows you to summon drones to fight with your team, but only if you are carrying a remote control. You can only carry two pieces of offensive gear into each mission, and they can't be changed during a mission, so if you're regularly playing with the same group of friends, it makes sense to specialize in different trees to cover the most bases. If a player is down during a mission, it starts a timer, and you have just five turns to finish the mission or you lose. In some missions, you'll be escorting the usual dead weight NPCs, and if one of those guys goes down, the mission is immediately lost. But if you lose a mission, you can just go back to the hub and try again. The game has a solid length, with plenty of missions on the main storyline progression, and a number of side missions along the way. For whatever reason, the first missions are only two-player co-op, and then starting around the sixth mission is when you get to play four-player. If you don't have enough live people to make up a party, you can recruit NPCs to join you. 
When you're all done with the main missions, there's a kind of end game with repeatable missions. Now there's a decent variety in the main missions, but you know, again like XCOM, after a while the action can get a little stale. There's only so many different ways you can dress up marching down a dark alleyway and killing people. That said, there's a decent variety in the enemies as well. Probably my biggest gripe about this game is the interface. There's a lot of interface elements that just don't seem to have been thought all the way through. Here's an example. I'm in between missions and I think I want to buy a new gun. So I go to the gun merchant and look at what's on offer. And as you can see, the stats for each weapon I can buy are shown in relation to the weapon I currently have equipped. The problem is, it's comparing against my primary weapon, which in this case is my katana. My gun is my secondary weapon. And there's no easy way to switch those slots. I have to manually equip something else in the slot with the gun to get the gun back in my inventory, and then I can swap it for the katana and then go back into the shop. And when I'm done, I have to do all of that in reverse. And when you're on a mission, it's easy to forget which weapon you used last. And you wind up shooting a guy that you just ran up to so that you could cut him with your sword. And that puts you in the habit of clicking on the weapon you want to use before you use it, which is fine, except that if you have a gun active and you click on it, you'll reload the weapon and waste your turn. So the interface can be a pain. And some people complain about the voice acting in this game, and, and I admit, the cheesy, fake Boston accents can be very painful to listen to. But look, I played the first Resident Evil, and compared to that, this game is a Broadway production. So what's the bottom line on Chakron, Boss Lock? My gaming group, who have been playing online games together since the days of the original Baldur's Gate, wanted a co-op experience that would give us a break from frenetic action games that tax our limited set of skills. Not to mention any by name. And that's what this does. It's fun in the way that tabletop gaming is fun, where there's pressure to get things right, but you can still relax. And the missions are short enough that when you screw up, you haven't wasted half an evening for nothing. On that basis, I recommend Scribble for fans of turn-based combat who want some co-op fun. As long as you understand that it's all about these missions and you're not getting some sort of co-op RPG. Now I haven't played any pickup games with a host of rando Calrissians, so I don't know how that would go. I also don't know that this has the same appeal to me as a single player game. So if you're intending to fly solo, I would recommend checking out the other games in the Shadowrun universe first. Ah, uh, whiskey.